It's good to be here. Thanks to whoever made the decision. That means that I do actually get the opportunity to speak. Um, it's my first time at an RSE con, having only been an RSE for about eight months now. Uh, and part of what I'll talk about today is lesson things I've come I came across in my time before as a researcher in astronomy, but I saw a lot there, um, and think I really see coming up in uh, life as an RSC as well. Um, so there's there's a a huge amount within what I will talk about, but I'm going to knowingly gloss over a lot of details because they're just a few core points that I want to make sure that I do get across. Um, but do find an opportunity, uh, you know, corner me at lunch or a coffee break or, or uh, at a social event or whatever, if you'd like to talk about anything in more detail. Um, and maybe we'll have a panel or something at RSECon um, 24. So to set the scene, uh, let me just talk about what I mean by this business of small programs and big programs. And like I said, I'm going to draw on uh, things I came across uh, as a researcher in astronomy. So there are two kinds of software that I came across, which are sort of represented in some sense in this picture. So this is a picture of, uh, I hope you recognize the sun, um, despite the fact that we live in the UK. Um, and what's also in this image is a little spot over on the side. I wonder, does this work? Yep, that works, uh, that there. And that is Venus making its way uh, across the surface of the sun from our perspective. So we see this, this dark spot. Um, and what's very popular in astronomy these days is trying to find planets rather than going around the sun. We know about those, mostly. Um, and we want to know about planets going around distant stars. So we want to find a distant Venus orbiting a distant sun. So this may instead be then an exoplanet making one of these transits. But we, we can't resolve the stars. Even in our most powerful telescopes, they are basically just points of light. And so what we see instead is this little drop in the apparent starlight as the planet makes its way across uh, the, the, our line of sight. So you see a small amount of light that's blocked out. And you can write down to read different levels of approximation what you think that dip in starlight is going to look like in, in the telescopes we build. We mostly do this from space where we can just watch a whole lot of stars for a long time without being interrupted by things that astronomers find frustrating, like the fact that night becomes day. Um, and having written down what this function looks like, you can then write software to fit that to the vast volumes of data. Um, and lots of people have done so. So I did a kind of very crude survey. I had a look around in a couple of places like uh, the Python package index and on GitHub and that sort of thing. Um, and it's worth looking at the, the common properties of a lot of this code. So partly by virtue of how I searched, I found code that is publicly available. Well, yes. Um, but the point here is that there is a lot of publicly available code, presumably more that is not publicly available, but the point is there's a lot that is. Um, a lot of it is open source. A lot of it is new in the sense of being probably less than 10 years old or so. Uh, often in high level languages, Python is by far the most common, but you do see a little bit of, there's a little bit of Julia. Uh, there's an, a language that was popular in astronomy called IDL. And then a vast range of the quality of software practice. So in some places, people have dumped a bunch of IPython notebooks into a GitHub repo and not updated it for five years. In some cases, it's a very well developed thing with all manner of continuous integration and tutorials and <clears throat> API docs and the rest. So keep that in mind, because in contrast, we can then go back to uh, our distant sun, and it is a star. And to study stars, to infer things about stars that we cannot infer directly, we build models to try to follow how they evolve over long periods of time. So we don't worry about the dynamics. We want to know how over millions and billions of years do the stars change, mostly because their composition is changing inside as they fuse the light elements into heavier elements to produce energy and, and shine. So the reason uh, you know, the sun is, for example, slowly over billions of years becoming a little bit denser because it's fusing hydrogen into helium at its center to create energy. And so when you see people make any statement about what they think stars did in the past or what they will do in the future, it's on the basis of these models. Um, to create the models, you have to solve a system of differential equations with some boundary conditions. Um, and if you look at the software for that, which we've been writing pretty much as long as astronomers have had access to computers, they've been writing software to solve those equations. So it goes back all the way to kind of uh, the 1950s. Uh, if you looked hard enough, you could probably find something written in like Fortran 1958, uh, whatever the, st the standard was. Um, so to have a look at the software here, I'm aided by, there was a particular special issue uh, of a journal about 15 years ago. There's a big code comparison. Um, and then I can add in a few that I know that weren't included there for, for reasons I know. Um, and what we now see is software that's pretty much the complete opposite. Okay, so this is software that is not publicly available. It's often handed down from an advisor to their students, to their students, to their students. Uh, and there will be no license at all. There, there is notable exception here. I know of one that is 
Um, a few, a few are publicly available. One is openly licensed. Uh, and so they're mostly old as well. So all but two of these codes, as far as I know, will trace their history back more than 30 years. And hence, I say you've got this advisor of handing it down over academic generations. Um, and mostly in Fortran, in particular, Fortran 77. I'll declare, I'm a fan of Fortran. I think Fortran is great and has its place. Woo, I found my people. Um, but a lot of these programs have a lot of Fortran 77, which is pretty much where it gets its bad name. So some postdoc will help out the new PhD students on trying to get the program to actually compile and run uh, on the local HPC. And they'll say like, why do you still use common blocks? We don't, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about this. Um, and there's not that much in the way of good practice. Some documentation, static PDF files, um, but not much more than that. Um, so the point here is that we have two very different flavors of software, right? We've got the kind of the new exoplanet Toronto data analysis stuff, which is all new, shiny, and has, you know, there'll be a, a JOS publication um, and a nice, you know, GitHub repo and the stellar evolution where you have to kind of knock on enough doors when you're at the right institution and maybe they'll let you, uh, they'll let you see their, their go-to statements. So to make sense of what's going on here, I'm going to draw on... Um, an idea from a blog post by Dan Katz, one of the keynote speakers who I'll, I'll, <laughs> is present, um, lurking at the back I see, um, called the software development curve. So what we've got here on, on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, is the total development effort that's gone into a program. So this is kind of person time, um, can be from developers, but remember writing documentation and doing the other stuff I think counts as well. Um, but doesn't represent necessarily the passage of time. Sometimes time passes when we're not working on programs and maybe functionality disappears because you know the ecosystem and the infrastructure around us changes. Um, and then on the, on the vertical axis, on the y-axis, we have the functionality. So this is, for researchers, this is like useful things researchers can do with your software. Um, so maybe your software works perfectly and you decide to uh, add some unit tests that doesn't really increase the functionality despite the effort that goes in. Um, it's a good idea. It will save you trouble later. Um, but at least from the user perspective, you wouldn't see the, the necessary rise in, in functionality. There are lots of ways you can make your way across this diagram then. You, what, you, what you want to go is, what you want to do is go straight up. You just don't want to have to put in any effort at all and get all the functionality that you want. But life's not like that. We have to write code. Um, but really the, the key is that they, for an overall program, as much as for a particular phase of development, there are kind of two extremes that, that Dan identified in his blog post, post for how you might proceed. Um, and one of them I'll call the kind of quick start pro, uh, programs. So this is where you, you start writing code and quite quickly you get something pretty useful. You're like, oh, you know, I've written my, I've written my, trans, my transit light curve or I've created the neat little build system that I need to make my program run um, and all is well. Uh, but then you find you want to start doing different things. So like, I've been working on my Linux workstation. Now I want to run it on my MacBook. Like, oh, I did not design this very well, did I? Um, so you need to start working a little bit, okay, behind the scenes um, on stuff that doesn't really add functionality, but fleshes out the code in, in ways that are important and, and are useful later. And I think this is what some people might describe as repaying technical debt. Um, but there are various examples. The example Dan brought up was um, was workflow software. So you might run you might write things for how you're going to run the sequence of uh, sequence of of programs or, or data analysis steps. But then the various things that you want to make uh, more adaptable, more versatile, and you find you have to start reshaping things a bit. Um, the opposite extreme is then what I would call slow start software. Um, and this is the stuff where before you can get something particularly useful, you actually have to lay a lot of foundational work. Um, and the classic example of this, the one that Dan uses as well, uh, is a lot of scientific simulation software. If you think of something like a fluid dynamic simulation, you need to worry about how you're going to, you know, what kind of a mesh are you going to solve on, how you're going to discretize your equations. Uh, if you're going to parallelize across a large, a large system, how are you going to be um, how are you, are you going to be doing the parallelization is it with the MPI messaging, or if you've got GPUs you need to do, all this sort of stuff. And you actually need to do quite a lot and maybe solve a few uh, test problems, you know, known scientific problems, before you can get to the research problems and start doing new exciting things. But once you've gone, got there, at least some someone comes along and they say, oh, I, we've determined a new diffusion coefficient for such and such a fluid dynamical process. And you're like, hey, I can just punch that into my program because I've done the foundational work and I can add functionality relatively easily. So that's the that's what we call the we call the slow start software. And what you are probably anticipating already is that I'm going to assert that our exoplanet data analysis type software is exactly this quick start stuff. 
And the stellar evolution stuff is down at the other end, uh, in part because it is the kind of thing where you have to solve these differential equations. So we see the separation uh, between researchers, you know, uh, writing their own code to solve whatever problem they have, sort of sunk cost fallacy sinks in, and they think, oh, if I just flesh out a few things here and there, I can turn what may have started as a, an almost uh, educational example for myself into, you know, uh, I, can, I can index it on the Python package index and, and other people can pip install it or whatever, even though there was already other software out there that could do it for me. Um, and conversely, you've got these slow start programs where there's this huge gap um, of development that needs to be, you know, crossed before you can get the useful stuff. So what happens is no one writes new software like that. And so we find ourselves sitting with stuff that has these, these archaic uh, links, um, with some exception. So one I'll point out from the stellar evolution side is uh, something that I still contribute to, a program called the Module for uh, Experiments in Stellar Astrophysics, so MESA. Um, it is relatively new. The first public release was 2011. It is open source. It's publicly available. So how how did it cross that gap? Um, that's a story, probably enough for a whole nother talk. See you again at RSE Econ 24. Or we'll ask me afterwards. Um, but I'm not sure how many lessons we can learn because it was a very contrived circumstance. Uh, in essence, uh, a stellar physics team at the University of California, Santa Barbara, found themselves luckily in the company of a retired computer scientist who was interested in their work and they started working together. And after about seven years uh, of all of his time, plus quite a lot of work from a, a few other people, um, they managed to cross this gap. And we, you know, we don't really have 10 to 15 full-time equivalents to, to throw around for writing new software all the time. Um, so it can be done perhaps, but uh, it's not clear how much to learn from that particular example. Um, but what's also worth saying here, because a bit of an assertion, not something that's obviously true, um, is that this, this dichotomy, the separation is bad, right? I'm, I'm going to claim that it's bad. And the reason I think it's bad is because, as I've already mentioned, on the one hand, no one kind of writes or maintains some of this, uh, some of the software with these old links. And then we still, I, as RSEs, I've come across some of it as well now, where it's quite, it's quite difficult to use, it's difficult to integrate. And, you know, I've, I've looked at however many, uh, you know, building however many Fortran or C++ programs over the years, you know, I can, I can deal with a few CMake errors, um, but it's a real barrier for researchers, right? For, for new PhD students, as I say, um, if you want fourth year undergraduates to work on research projects, it's a, it's a steep barrier. Um, and on the other side, you've got all these programs over here where you, you're just recovering the same ground. So among those programs, um, and I, I worked with a couple of them, there are some that definitely do more than others do. They are more functional. They are better designed. They're easier to maintain and things. Uh, but even so, you've got the others uh, that creep in and people decide to, in the first place, write um, and use instead. So you're definitely retreading ground. And so the, while from the individual perspective, they're not that many negative consequences necessarily. There's certainly uh, from you know, research as a whole enterprise, um, a bit of a waste in terms of spending more time, spending time here that could be spent to make better gains uh, over here. And I, had, I tried to give quite a lot of thought to what is, the, what is the, the distilled problem of what's happening here? What's the neatest way of trying to explain it, even though it has to try to consume quite a lot of, of detail? Uh, and to me, the issue is that it's it's just easier and it's more rewarding to write your own new software than to extend someone else's software, to collaborate on it, to contribute to it, and all that sort of thing. Um, and so what I'll start slowly wrapping up with is just throwing out a couple of ideas of things we can do, things we to some extent already do do, um, to try to kind of flip this statement around. Um, and to start wrapping up, I'll just kind of throw them all up there. And this is a couple of ideas from me. You may have your own. I'd, I'd love to hear them. Um, progressing steadily from the left to the right, from things that are relatively easy, things that we already do, perhaps, uh, towards things that are increasingly difficult, increasingly vaguely defined, more nebulous, um, but perhaps ultimately more important. So some things that we do do um, that are useful are, are teaching basic software skills, right? So because the same tools that we teach researchers for the sake of their own software are the ones that make collaboration um, an extension easier, right? So the fact that we tell people to uh, use version control and upload their programs to um, you know, public repositories is good because that's the place where we can make merge requests and pull requests and they can receive them, right? So they learn to interact with those platforms by virtue of learning uh, the basic tools. Um, and also interacting with RSEs on their projects helps, right? So the more that we are around 
uh, in project, we can start saying to people when they say, oh yeah, we're going to write a new tool to do this amazing thing. And you can quickly have a look and say, well, actually, um, I had a look on PyPy and GitHub, um, and there are already existing packages that do this, and I can show you how to use them. Um, and maybe we can push a few things back up uh, to try to make them easier to use. Um, and somewhere where I think the community is already going is, for example, teaching how to use some of these tools as collaboration tools. So I think the, the intermediate software skills, software carpentry that's, uh, that's being developed, I think is interesting. It does, does a few of these things already. Um, I think a spin on that is trying to teach researchers as well how to design things to be a bit easier to sustain. Um, so one of the headaches I come across uh, in my short time so far as an RSC is when someone's decided, yes, I'm going to write a program in Python, and what I will do is I will import everything. Um, and having imported everything, you then find you know one little version changes, and you quickly in dependency help. And what we can tell people is that you know we can try to avoid this. You can make conscious decisions about what you what you do or do not need to depend on. Um, some of the things that are that um, are more difficult might require more effort. Maybe you know have have less uptake. Um, might be things like starting to teach good practice. Uh, in the compiled languages. So, you know, uh, the ones that we struggle with here are things like Fortran and C and C++. There is a parallel session happening um, somewhere else in this building right now where people are talking about modern training for modern Fortran, which is excellent. And I think, you know, C and C++ would help. Because what we're looking for there is things like telling researchers, you know, you can, you can write a new program in C++ using a whole lot of existing software. And here is how you would do it. Because bearing in mind, it's not as, it's not as simple as import my favorite library. Um, as, as in Python or whatever the equivalent in, in R or Julia might be, but you have to make sure that you, you know, you'll build it, you'll link it, and all these things that researchers don't necessarily come across. Um, one of my own kind of pet ideas that I occasionally trot out is this thought that some of the software practice that we teach, we could probably sneak into some undergraduate teaching if we tried. So there, a lot of undergraduates say, you know, in physics and, and STEM subjects, we'll be taking a computing in geography, computing in psychology or whatever. And that might be a place where if we start sneaking in some of the things like version control, um, so that they arrive in their research careers, they start their PhDs, having had two years of exposure already to those things and time to develop and understand how the, how the ecosystem of tools work will benefit. Um, but ultimately, and I'll just finish off what I think is the, the most difficult hurdle to cross is this aspect of the reward. So what we talk about a lot, I think, is reward for developing software. And I think some of the things that we do work well for people writing new programs. And so you can say, you know, I created this new software, I have generated uh, some citable element, like say a Joss paper or PyOpenSci or or whatever, um, and people can cite that. And then you go to the bean counters at the universities and say, behold, count all these beans. Um, and everyone's happy with your metrics. Um, but what's more difficult is when you start contributing um, to things. So, you know, is there the recognition for someone who comes along and says, like, you know, yes, I'm I'm one of the maintainers of the some of the differential equations that are available in SciPy. Now, that sounds pretty important. If I were an undergraduate studying applied mathematics, I would be interested to be taught by someone who is uh, is an expert in that sense. Um, so perhaps one of the things we can do is at least try to help people recognize these roles as well. So we, you know, we might recognize that someone is the chair of a of a group in whatever professional society. Perhaps we can also say things like this person is also such and such a developer on some major software package that is relevant for uh, whatever field of study. Um, and so that's, as I say, the spread of a few ideas I've had. I hope others have more. Let me know. It'll be great. Um, and just to wrap up with what the objective is like I said, is to turn the statement around, right? We want it to be easier and more rewarding to be able to extend and contribute to other people's software than to write our own each time. Otherwise, researchers will carry on doing so uh, rather, than, uh, rather than maintaining the stuff where we get more benefit. Thanks. Thank you very much. And um, there are already a couple of questions on the Slido. So can we apply pressure until code review becomes part of peer review in journals? ordered bad code and get papers retracted. <laughs> so I think I think this is a this is a good idea. I like this. Um, and I know for what it's worth, the American Astronomical Society journals um, have data editors as well as um, as uh, the article edit, uh, sorry, article review. So you submit an article and people will have a look at that sort of thing. 
I don't know to what extent that avoids the situation of people um, still just rewriting their own code. I think I think quite a lot of the incentives we've devised uh, actually work to encourage people to just publish more new stuff rather than work on old stuff. There are structures around that. So something like Joss, for example, um, does accept papers which are updates to programs that already exist. Um, but I'm not. I'm not sure that the just you know reviewing code that would that feels like too late to say. Oh, actually, you should have used something else. Okay, thank you. Um, research, uh, whoop, researcher rewards tailored to encourage make your. Oops, let me know. I have to read that first. Oh uh, yeah. So the, I think the point is that um, your PIs or supervisors might be pressing you to create your own new thing. Um, uh, yes, and that th that is true, uh, I, I would say. Uh, how do we fix it? I, I honestly don't know. I think the, the main thing is that if your, P if your PI can at least recognize that reusing someone else's code is a better use of your time. So what, what you want to do is find programs that you can use to get more science done. So you can say, yes, I could write my own program, or I could publish two papers instead of one. Um, I think that would be the the argument that would sway uh, someone like a like a PI who's pressing in that direction. Um. Thank you. So um, the big issue of funding and journals tend to support novelty over contribution to existing code bases in many fields. A long-standing problem. Is there a way to overcome that? Please give us the answer now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that. Th th Honestly, that's that's pretty much the question I'm asking. Um, I think that is that is one of the critical points. Um, one of so one of the other moves I'm aware of, and this comes from a funny direction as well, is uh, the Simons Foundation in the U.S. runs a series of computational centers in subject whatever. Uh, I'm most aware of the work in the astrophysics group, and they've actually put up two RSE-like positions, which are available for applications until like roughly the end of the year. Um, to maintain major astronomy packages. MESA is actually one of them, um, and then another one's called AstroPy, which is kind of the go-to great big Python project for lots of uh, steps in astronomical, uh, yeah, astronomical data analysis. But that's the thing is that's coming. That's not coming from a well. It's a sort of a funding agency, but it's a you know it's a philanthropic thing where uh, they have much more. They can just decide at, at easier whims how they do things. For national funding agencies, I think it's much more complicated. Um, and definitely something that needs to be, uh, yeah, needs to be overcome. But I don't know how either. I am sorry. <laughs> um, you make it sound like conscious choices. Is it maybe more organic software churn evolution that leads to survivor bi bias, making us think contributing to existing is better than messy experimentation? Maybe the small packages are crucial to drive innovation. So this is this is a very good question, and this is a very good point. Um, and I, I, I think to think about it to myself as how do you, how many software packages should you have in any given niche? Um, certainly I think the answer is, is more than two because we have other systems in life that tend to boil down to, um, two competing parties, which doesn't work so well. Um, so the answer is at least three. I feel like it just, it isn't more than a dozen probably. Um, but you, you do want small packages in things like, uh, new languages, you know, uh, a lot of these are written in Python. We maybe we do want more in in Julia, uh, or someone comes along and wants to do something in, in R instead. Um, so I think so you will. There should be some number of other packages out there. Um, there needs to, the thing. The big change I think is an openness to receive. One, one of the big things is uh, an openness to receiving changes from from contributors. I think a lot of researchers they put up their code. They're like, "Hey, I've got this amazing publicly available open source code," and then you open a, a pull request, and you know, crickets. You get absolutely no response, um, and it then just sits there in a repo doing nothing. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree. So some small packages are would be necessary, and people will demonstrate new features. You know, new, a new scientific thing. Someone will will rewrite the maths. To how you how you decide what a transit life code looks like, uh, and somehow that must be implemented. Thanks. And the last question: How do we make existing slow start packages more accessible and desirable to contribute to? So better open source. Yeah. So it's 
I, it's difficult from the user's side, other than sort of campaigning to the maintainers, because quite often the issue I'm, I, I find is behind these these kind of slow start packages is that they they are barely maintained, or that there's there's very little maintenance effort that goes in. Um, if they aren't hosted in public repos, it's difficult to you know put changes in. They don't have a release cycle, um, and so there's a there needs to be a push to try to uh, release them and. Uh, at, at least maybe at no cost to the people who at some point uh, maintain them. Um, you can kind of build parallel structures as well. So you can say for anyone who uses this program, here is a site where the community is getting together to put together things like build scripts, their own tutorials and how to's. Because a lot of the time, you know, the you, some, it, as long as someone tells you what the interface is, you can then write scripts to deal with this. Um, and, and that's fine. So, you know, if you, if you don't want to write Fortran nameless files or whatever obscure format the person has devised, um, so be it. Uh, but if someone, uh, you know, if a community can still then organize around that externally. So if you, I think if you can find enough, uh, people with common interest, that would be, that would be a good place to kind of, uh, you know, start a route of four or six people who want to say, here's how we build it on these different systems. Uh, let us know how we build it on, how you build it on yours. And we can accommodate that uh, and start fleshing out some of the gaps. Okay, thank you.